Welcome to Just Relationships, the show that offers you concrete ways to make your relationships better. Whether it's your boss, your spouse, your children, or your friends, the quality of your relationships in life directly affects how you feel about yourself and the success you achieve. Your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer, a psychotherapist, telecoach, author, and seminar leader, will interview top experts to help you learn to manage this essential part of your life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer. Greetings to you. Well, I personally am in for such a treat today, and I sure do hope you feel the same way as you are listening to Dr. David Rico, who is the author of several books, How to Be an Adult, A Handbook on Psychological and Spiritual Integration, How to Be an Adult in Relationships, and How to Be an Adult in Faith and Spirituality. Uh, Is this your most recent uh, book, uh, David Rico, Dr. David Rico? No, my most recent book um, is... um, called Five True Things, and it was published by Shambhala about two months ago. Oh, how exciting. It's uh, basically how to accept the givens of life, Mm. the things we cannot change, which is most things. Right, (laughs) right, the givens. Would you care to say what those five things are now? Sure. Okay. It's that everything changes and ends. Mm. That yeah. things don't always go according to our plans. Mm. <clears throat> that pain is part of life. That uh, people are not loving and loyal all the time. And that life is not always fair. Mm. And if we can accept those with an unconditional yes, that would be the equivalent of an adult spirituality. Yes, yes. Yes, Are the, and these can be very hard lessons, David. Um, I know for me, they not all of them. I, I certainly have accepted that pain is a part of life and not everything goes according to our plans and everything changes and ends. And it's more recently that I've come to the idea that Even people who are loving people whom I love who love me are not always loving and not always loyal. And um, and that that last one, um, I'm sorry, what was that last one? Life isn't always fair. Right, that is. And as a psychotherapist myself, I, I deal with this question with my clients many, many times. It's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. And um, yeah, so that's the answer, right? The that yeah, yes, and that's you're more right. adult when you uh, accept these, shall we say, unalterable, albeit unwelcome, givens of human life. Right, and that somehow you see them as um, what it will take to help us grow. Oh. So yeah, these are we can become these, more mature as we accept these. We I become see. more stable in the world. So as we have these kinds of experiences where our loved ones are love is not always um, people are not always loving and loyal all the time. That as we come to accept that and perhaps deal with the hurt and some injury around that that mm-hmm. that <clears throat> that we would then adjust our expectations to a more appropriate setting mm. it's an unconditional yes to what we cannot change and that gives us serenity yes yes and then there are things that we can change and you know we want the courage to do that yes and i live my life according to the serenity prayer and um i also think even though uh aa uh, adopted it it, i i think it's wonderful for everyone i think it is the core of all stress management and as you're saying it's the core of of even spiritual growth Mm -hmm. yeah yeah very much so 
because you talk in your How to Be an Adult book that uh, we evolve ideally um, from our neurotic ego to our uh, through our healthy ego to our spiritual self mm-hmm. and that we um, explore certain feelings fear anger guilt and we build our self-esteem and through struggle one learns to maintain boundaries and build intimacy and in relationships and it's that old story of the, the, the butterfly wouldn't be um, so strong to fly if it hadn't that try to get out of the uh, the chrysalis, the cocoon, or it was the chrysalis, getting out of the cocoon. That whole that whole point of view of mm-hmm. growing pains, yeah. And I'm just wondering um, if someone is an addict. Okay, if you no, know, so many people we're considered to be a nation of addicts. And so many people are addicted, whether it's a a hardcore addiction, you know, putting a needle in an arm or or it's uh, too much shopping or TV watching. The the root of all addictions, in my view, is to stop pain. And then when people are behaving as addicts, they they behave rather unethically, unkindly. And um, yet they they are st- striving many people who are addicts are not striving to have growth or to be better but many are and if someone strives to be ethical and they are still an addict which and it's hard for them not to be say if it's something like food or something like that where it's it's just harder to to stop is mm-hmm. it is it that they um, are unethical? How how does one work with ethics and um, and the pain of imperfection um, and not and if one wants to be a good person, how can mm-hmm. one deal with that? Uh, I don't. I, I'm sure you didn't expect such a question. No, it's okay. I, mm. I follow what you say. Okay, good. Um, Thank you. Well, first of all, um, now we know that addiction is um, a psychological issue and a spiritual one. And it's not really in the realm of morality or ethics. It's more in the realm of some type of illness that probably goes back to early trauma and we're trying to work with people who have this problem with a spiritual program like the 12 step program that puts the accent on finding a connection to a higher power that you can rely on rather than relying on a substance or food or sex or gambling or whatever and I think it's a, um, a more compassionate view of how it all works. Mm. So to have the compassionate view, and and if one goes ahead and indulges in a in a uh, addiction or a bad habit, and and is so so self critical, um, yeah. to move into self compassion, right? The self critical style does not lead to recovery. It's the self-compassion style that works. Right. And yet people believe that the only way to behave as better people is to chastise themselves, even flagellate themselves. Yeah, there's something in us. I mean, another one of the givens is that we often look down on ourselves, don't appreciate our own human value as people and of course we're sometimes surrounded by family members or others who put us down and don't uh, esteem the value that we have of course it leads to low self-esteem and that's often part of how addiction thrives you know, in that kind of atmosphere. Mm. 
Yeah, how addiction thrives when when we are put down and it's kind of like you're trying to uh, heal your foot, but you're you're still wearing the wrong shoe that's giving you blisters. And sometimes people can't necessarily take off that shoe. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about people, some of my clients who are living with abusive people in their lives. And mostly, well, I would say mostly, um, I- initially, it's because they, they are believe they are or truly are financially stuck and then of course there's the the emotional attachment um that they're not often so well aware of but um so they still have to wear that same terrible shoe and it Mm. becomes much harder to heal that foot yeah yeah i think that's a very good way to look at it and all of this brings up compassion, right? And and which is a central uh, spiritual practice. Oh, okay. I like I like that that look. So, compa- it would be compassion for the abusive person. Um, I'm thinking of p- mothers who love their children. I'm thinking about um, a mother and an adult child. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can say, well, I know I love my child, um, but this is how I am. I just naturally put him or her down. This is this is what I do in life. This is this is all I know. And um, so to say that one has compassion for such a person, why they have to behave that way, and then compassion for self, and to not put themselves down along with it. Mm, kind of yeah, not to collude, point. right? Not to collude right. with the oppressor. And so many mm-hmm. people do. They they internalize the criticism. Yeah. They internalize the oppression. Yeah. So, all right. I'm. I'm. Your your book, How to Be an Adult in Faith and Spirituality. Um, there's you quote Carl Jung. You have wonderful quotes, but this is my favorite. If our religion is based on salvation, our chief emotions will be fear and trembling. If our religion is based on wonder, our chief emotion will be gratitude. I just love that, and I love Carl Jung, and he had mm-hmm. something to do with spirituality, of course, and, and he was indirectly related to the forming of, of AA in the, in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. And um, I know that you talk about egoic religion, um, kind of traditional religion, uh, and a more spiritual orientation. So would you uh, talk to, uh, to that a bit? Yes. it's um, Well, first of all, we're, I guess, distinguishing between religion and spirituality. So let me say a, a little bit about how we make the distinction. Mm -hmm. So we could say that um, religion has four main components. Beliefs, moral code, rituals, and personal relationship. Mm -hmm. So beliefs are um, what what, uh, are listed in a creed for instance, I believe in God, I believe in heaven or hell or whatever it may be. Um, and religions have this in common, that they have beliefs, but of course the, all the beliefs are different. Then mm-hmm. we have a moral code, such as Ten Commandments or uh, you know, whatever particular rules govern ethics and morality. Mm-hmm. And then we have rituals, which differ in each religion. And and finally, we have a sense of how we as individuals could build or establish a personal relationship to God or higher power. Mm -hmm. So in religion, these four, in a religion, these four are set. Uh, by the 
central authority of a particular church. And spirituality is simply taking those same four elements, but designing them for yourself. So you decide yourself what your beliefs are, what moral code you will follow, what kind of rituals you would like to engage in, like you might set up a little altar, have some incense, you might have a statue, but it's designed by you mm. as opposed to um, an established structure or hierarchy or uh, religious authority. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you have your personal sense of devotion to, you know, Buddha or God or Divine Mother, you know, whatever works for you. So really the difference, people say I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. Mm -hmm. What they mean is I've taken the elements of religion and I have designed them myself rather than accepting the design that a church might impose upon me. Mm. Now, obviously, you could be both religious and spiritual, or mm -hmm. you could be just religious and not spiritual, or mm -hmm. you could be just spiritual and not religious. But um, the element, the four elements are the same. That's so interesting, and I can imagine the more traditionally religious people would say, well, you're making this up yourself and designing your own um, rituals and, and principles, and I don't know that you're trustworthy. You know, you, you may be making something up that's self-indulgent or just, you know, yes, for yourself. We will. Yeah, the spiritual people might be judged by the religious people who hold fast to a tradition, mm -hmm. and vice versa, the spiritual people might look down on people who are um, loyal to a particular religious tradition. Yes, yes. And it would be nice if we could all just, you know, accept each other as, you know, as long as you're not harming others, then uh, we acknowledge your freedom. Yes, you're right, and I do. I do see that. I do see uh, the the judgment going both ways. And just to let everyone know, this is Dr. Duffy Spencer. We are WHPC, and I am interviewing Dr. David Rico, who, uh, and particularly on his book, "How to Be an Adult in Faith." And spirituality, yes. So I, I do. I can appreciate that, and I can appreciate the, the non-judgment of that. I also do. I guess I do have some sort of value judgment here around that to, the idea of um, the neurotic ego versus the healthy ego, and then, the spiritual self. Um, I, and I do think that there is some risk involved, that we all have spiritual risks to take or not to take, if, if you will. And I think of a spiritual risk as being, being willing to be true to yourself and, and your own beliefs. And um, even in the face of other people shaming you. Mm, yes. I agree. Yeah. Would you say that it's better to um, not just blindly follow a tradition, but to arrive at your own your own way of, of thinking and believing, if that's possible? It does seem valuable to me. Uh, I think um, Henry James, who wrote the famous book, um, I'm sorry, William James, William, his yes, brother, yes. wrote the famous book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. And he makes a good point. He says that all religions begin with a personal experience. Mm. So Jesus had a personal experience of God as a father, 
hence our Father who art in heaven. Mm -hmm. Muhammad had a particular experience of Allah and so forth with all the religions. Now, um, James, William James warns us that we might have a second-hand religion. So we're going by somebody else's experience rather oh. than our own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he proposes that um, we might want to say that we're truly religious when it comes from our own experience rather than just what we were taught in Sunday school or catechism. Mm -hmm. Then we're, we're taking the, the word of somebody else who also didn't have an experience. And, um, of course, the saints, especially the mystics, did have a personal experience. And that explains their wonderful work in the world. It led them to be more loving and more caring about others. Um, so, so I would make that distinction, like, mm -hmm. or I would ask that question, uh, how much of your religious belief is based on uh, your own personal experience of the divine mm. and how much is simply passed on to you like information yeah. in a class on any subject. Mm. See what I mean? I do, I do. And the way you put that, a personal experience of the divine, um, maybe I have and maybe I haven't had that. I, I know that Ab Abraham Maslow talks about peak experiences, and mm -hmm. I certainly have had my share of those, you know, literally the beauty of a sunset. Yeah, it often happens in nature. Yes, yes, it does. And even when I was lucky enough to go to Italy and, and, and see the statue of David up close and personal, I actually, I actually started to cry from the beauty, the beauty of David, the statue. And mm -hmm. I just couldn't believe how a human being could have created such magnificent beauty. I, I just literally stared for a long time and, and just cried, kind of weeping from joy, if you will. Mm, well, how beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an example of an experience. Yes. In other words, you were touched at a deeper level than words. Right. And that's what a religious experience is about. Right. A deeper level than words, absolutely. So I, I think many people can relate to that when you when you put it in those terms. I know that um, some of my clients who have a hard time getting in touch with their feelings, they will sometimes speak and start to and and start start to feel their words, especially when they're talking about love or connection with someone and they're almost startled by um, their being so touched and <clears throat> unfortunately many people have learned to stifle tears so rather than stop right there and, and just feel and to explore they'll just talk themselves away they'll you know they'll, they'll start talking story again rather than experience mm. and um, yeah. yeah that's an important distinction Yes, yes. <clears throat> and here you are, a psychotherapist and a Jungian tra and transpersonal psychotherapist and, of course, teacher. And how do you, I mean, would you care to, to talk about what it means to be a transpersonal psychotherapist? Many people don't know that term or know what it means. Basically, it's... Um an appreciation of a larger life that we all participate in that extends our identity so that 
we are more than just what's on our driver's license. We trans means go beyond. We go beyond our personal, singular, unique identity and feel a connection with all beings and feel a larger life in the whole universe that we all participate in. And when you have this sense that I am touching in on something bigger than just my puny ego, that's the equivalent of contact with the divine. Mm. So transpersonal um, also goes with what we've been talking about, you know, having a personal experience of a higher power. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think about how the average person who may not be looking necessarily for that or for a spiritual awakening um, could do that. And I'm thinking of even things like um, this thing that people do in, in uh, sports stadiums where they do this wave. Do you mm-hmm. know? You know they, they all stand up and they all move in a certain way and uh, in, uh, in a synchronized way. And uh, I've never personally done it, but I can appreciate that it must feel like it's, you know, you're part of a bigger whole and Mm. that everyone's involved. That's a really wonderful analogy. Yeah. Mm. It's an acknowledgement that we're all moving in uh, one direction, even though we're all different. Right, right. Yes, and in our age of of, um, diversity where differences are so stark and so polarized, to to really um, find the commonality, the commonality in people, Mm -hmm. Um, and as you say, always going back to compassion, even when someone is is literally being cruel or, or thoughtless, I think that's what makes it the hardest and that and yeah. maybe that person is not even feeling apologetic at all yeah it doesn't go by apology it goes by our own letting go of ill will or the need to retaliate and instead seeing the pain in someone else while not at the same time allowing him or her to harm us like we're not ex- we're not um, becoming a doormat but we still feel um, empathic uh, toward someone who's in such pain that he would inflict pain so um, we're, we're picking up on that element yes well on that note that is so beautiful dr david rico author of how to be an adult in faith and spirituality and to be in touch with dr david rico is uh dave rico.com dave rico.com where you can uh find his books and some information about him And Rico is spelled R-I-C-H-O. So thank you so much again, Dr. David Rico. I really appreciate you giving me this interview. Well, thank you, Dr. Duffy. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. And this is Dr. Duffy Spencer saying goodbye for now and wishing you great relationships.